able to raise money way faster, way more than they thought they could so that they can establish a, a place of worship and also a place where they can, they can send people out to do, your, to do your work. God, we lift up all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ben. It's also good to have Daniil up here. He's normally on the drums, and so he's been on keys and vocals today. Good job, Daniil. There's one other uh, personal announcement I wanted to let you know about just before I jump into the message today, because many of you have asked for an update. Uh, we've been praying for Vitaly and Milana uh, Lagogni, and last Sunday, uh, they're members of our church. They serve in the kids' ministry, and I've been here for many years. He had an accident that resulted in a, an emergency brain surgery and partial removal of his skull, and so they're going through that recovery. And we wanna pray for them uh, and just pray that God continue to move in their lives. There's a GoFundMe page. Many of you have already been very generous there, and so if you're interested, you can check that out through our Facebook uh, and find out more about their GoFundMe page. But would you just join me right now? This family needs us to stand with them in prayer, and we believe in the power of prayer, don't we? I mean, there is power in the prayer of agreement. And I teach this to, to teenagers all the time. The prayer of agreement is not just listening to me. That's called listening. That's nice, but that's not agreement. It's kind of like when you play tug of war and everybody grabs the rope. You don't just have everybody holding the rope and one guy pulling and the rope just slides through their hands. That's not, everybody grabs and pulls together. That's what the prayer of agreement is. It's like, I'm praying, we're all grabbing the rope and we're all pulling together, amen? Would you stand in agreement with me right now for the Lagognes? Let's pray. So Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, and we know that you are the one that ordained all of our days before one of them came to be, that you placed us on this planet, that you're the one that formed us and fashioned us. God, you know how every muscle, cell, ligament, joint is supposed to function. And so we pray for Vitaly right now, God, as he is fighting for his life, as he is going through this process. Lord, we pray that you would touch his body, supernaturally bring strength and healing to his body, God. We pray protection over him, that he remain free from any infection. In Jesus' name, God, we pray for the doctors, the nurses, everybody that's working together to have the right plan and the right approach to help him uh, through this this difficult situation, we pray that you would give them wisdom, give them unity, God, that you would be the one as, as they step in, God, that you would guide their hands. In Jesus' name, God, we pray for, for Milana and the family that you would comfort them right now. You said you'd send the Holy Spirit to comfort us in our time of need, and we pray that you comfort them right now by the power of your Holy Spirit, and we all agree in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you for joining me in prayer. And let's continue to pray for them and believe God uh, for great things for their lives. Well, today is uh, Miracle Sunday. So we wrapped up our Miracles Initiative a while back. We went through this whole launch and talked about what this Miracles Initiative is all about. And today's Miracle Sunday, so once a month, we're just gonna give you an update, let you know what's going on. And so we bring out some of the things that people have both been praying for and some of the miracles that have already happened and take place. And a miracle is defined as this. Any event, whether explainable or not, which strengthens the faith of believers. Because any kind of supernatural, miraculous thing that happens, there will always be somebody that can try to explain it away, right? So the definition that we're working with is this. Any event, whether explainable or not, which deepens the faith of believers. And we've been praying for and believing God for miracles in the lives of people in this community. And the verse that we had that was our, our primary verse for this initiative was right out of Isaiah. And it says, to prepare the way to remove every obstacle, to build up the road. And the idea and the context of this and the prophet Isaiah is talking about is the arrival of a majestic king. And as the king is preparing to come, you prepare the way. You build the road up. You move obstacles out of the way. And we're believing God for the arrival of a majestic king into our lives, into the lives of people in this community. And so we need to do our part to prepare the way, to build up and to remove obstacles. And so that's what this Miracles Initiative was about. And the biggest obstacle for us to get out of the way was debt. And that's not a flashy you know, thing that a lot of campaigns are built around, but we felt like this was what was responsible for us. We wanna get rid of that debt, and so that's what, we're removing that obstacle. We did this initiative, and one of the big things was to shift money from debt service to community service, to stop building bank buildings and build the kingdom of God, amen? And that's what this initiative was all about, and you guys responded great. Today is just a reminder to say, if you made your pledge, you can do that uh, through the blue envelope 
envelope and give in the offering or online through the app, however you did it. If you're new to the church, you wanna be a part of it, feel free to jump in. There's books like this out there that tell you more about the initiative and what it's for, but we really believe that God's called us to be a force of generosity in this community. And I just wanna give you a couple of examples of people so far, we've just heard some stories coming in, and one was from one of our elders, Ronnie Warren, and he was about to make his his commitment, his pledge for his family. And just as he was about to make that commitment, he felt like God just stopped him and basically said, don't make that commitment. He's like, that was close. <laughs> and then God said, no, I want you to make this commitment. And it was more than he was prepared for, more than he felt comfortable doing. He felt comfortable making this commitment, but he went ahead, went ahead by faith and made this other commitment. And within just a couple of weeks, he had unexpected income happening, and he walked into our elders meeting, and he goes, there's a miracle. And just like already a couple of months now, this has happened each month that he made that commitment. Well, it doesn't always work just like that, but that is an amazing, and hopefully it builds your faith. It certainly built his faith, and it's a miracle. So right in our, my own family, Josiah come home from work a couple weeks ago and I was already in bed uh, and he came in and he said, hey dad, I'm home. I'm like, okay, thanks Joe. And uh, he said, I, I want to tell you something that happened at work. And where he works, there's a lady that comes in to his job who is, she's somewhat elderly and she's had a stroke and so it's very difficult for him and for others to sometimes understand her when she speaks. And he feels embarrassed for her when he has to ask her to repeat herself. And many times he's had to ask her to repeat herself four or five times and he just feels bad for her and he doesn't want her to be embarrassed. He said, I saw her coming in and so I was, you know, in private, he said, I just prayed and said, God help, please help me understand her so that I don't have to embarrass her and ask her to repeat herself. Simple prayer, right? And he said, Dad, I did not have to ask her to repeat herself one time. It's the first time ever. And he said, I don't know, I'm just saying, it built my faith, and you said, anything explainable or not, that's built, so he said, good job on miracles, dad. Well, <laughs> I was so happy. We're believing that God's gonna do amazing things. And when you give to the initiative, here's how it works. And this was a formula that our board of trustees put together. 82% goes to the debt reduction to get rid of it. 13% goes to a facilities reserves so that as things happen around here, we can take care of them. And then 5% goes to savings so we can be prepared for the future and to be able to continue to invest in ministry down the road, amen? And already what we're gonna be able to do, and I'll keep updating you on this, with what has already been given, we will be meeting with the bank and modifying our loan, and we're already gonna be able to save several thousand dollars a month, and instantly that'll go right into ministry. So that is amazing. There's your miracles update. Now as I jump into the message, we're continuing down this, this ancient path. Jeremiah chapter six says, this is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient path where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. So the idea here is not looking for the new thing, the new trendy thing, not looking at all the market research and trying to, it says look at the ancient paths, the things that God has already established and ask for the right way and then, and then walk in that and then you'll find rest for your souls and so that's what we've been doing and we're in this season of Lent and in the ancient times, Lent was used to prepare people for baptism on Easter. It was a time when, when new believers were taken through a process and they were prepared for baptism, or people that have been away from God go through a process of renewal. And then on Easter, they, they renew their covenant, they, they renew their relationship with the Lord. And that's what we're actually gonna be doing. I mean, this is a very old custom, ancient tradition. In fact, baptism is not just a New Testament thing. It was an Old Testament thing in Jewish culture. They already had it. It was called a mikvah. And this is what you would do is basically a baptism. And that's what John was doing. That's why Jesus knew to do it. And so, uh, and you see that all th reflected through the New Testament. And so we're gonna be doing that on Easter. If you've never been baptized and you wanna be baptized, we wanna encourage you to sign up, either in person, out at the Next Steps, or online, and we're gonna be doing it in both of our services, the early service and the late service. We'll be doing baptisms as a part of our Easter celebration, celebrating the new life that God brings, amen? And so if you've never been baptized, we wanna encourage you to do that, or some people have said to me, you know, I was baptized as a kid or as a baby, do I need to be re-baptized? 
The answer to that is no, you don't need to be rebaptized. But what some people choose to do is a, a renewal of their baptismal vows. It's kind of like when a couple renews their vows. They're not getting remarried, they're doing a whole ceremony and renewing their vows. And so, and it's very common in, in many churches to do a vow renewal, a baptismal vow renewal. And so if you're interested in doing that, uh, we're gonna do that on, on Easter Sunday. And I can already tell you some of the ones that are gonna be baptized it's gonna be pretty, pretty amazing, some of the testimonies and stories that have already, as people have been signing up, letting us know what God has been doing in their life. So we wanna encourage you to do that. There's three reasons to be baptized. To demonstrate a changed life, to declare publicly a new association, and to follow Jesus' example. He did it himself, and he said to do it. That's a good enough reason right there. And so these are three good reasons why you should be baptized. If you're interested in joining us and doing that on, on Easter, let us know. If you're online, you can, you can let them know in the chat or sign up that way, and we'll make that happen for you as well. And Lynn is one of those elements in the Christian practice that binds the Christian community together and to our beginnings. It's a season where I choose to let go of something to make room for God in my life, to commit to something, to reflect on my own humanity. And we've been examining during this season Benedict of Nursia's rules for Christian formation, as some know him as Saint Benedict, and the Christian rules for formation. And for the next few weeks, we're gonna be examining specific rules, and by rules, he doesn't mean you know, raise your hand before you speak. It's more of a, a guide for life, a rule of life. We're gonna be examining rules that focus on others. Today, we're looking specifically at helping the poor. It's very important to understand when, when he wrote this in his century at a time when we've already established that Rome was in turmoil, you know, politically and socially, it was in decline, there was a lot going on. And, uh, and we see what was going on in his society and, and what that was doing and to the indulgences and just to the, the uh, um, obsessions that people had with entertainment and pleasure and things like that. And we see that happen in our culture today. And many in his day, even though people were, the wealthy were uh, uh, kind of obsessed with that, many people lived in fear not knowing what the next day might bring, where their meal might come from. And we all saw in 2020 times of turmoil and uncertainty and uh, what we saw was not, the result of that was not, in most cases, human charity. What you saw is people blasting each other on Facebook and social media about certain things that were going on in 2020, and it kind of became a polarizing thing instead of it really being something that exposed human charity, it exposed human selfishness. You had people that already had a lot. And anybody in here get a little bit afraid of the toilet paper shortage? I mean, you're laughing, so I'm guessing that means it's like, yes, you did, right? We all got a little bit worried about that. We never knew how dependent we were on something like that until suddenly we're threatened with it not being there. And people who had a lot were still piling up stacks of it, right? Meanwhile, people that really needed it, yeah, <laughs> didn't have it. Um, well, one of the things that Benedict saw as the solution to that, and I think is today, was to, uh, to, to fight that worldly impulse is to actually be intentional about caring for others, specifically those that are in need and the poor. Because we all, we all get drawn into that impulse. I mean, the, the lure of materialism is real and the fear of lack is real. You can have a lot and be afraid it's all gonna be gone, right? And so the, the, way to, the way to fight that impulse and that worldly impulse is to show care for others and to care for the poor. In fact, this is something that is very important throughout scripture. You will, I'm gonna read you a few passages right now. And I really wanna allow, I want you to allow the Holy Spirit just to speak through his word as I read these passages to you. And when you read the Bible, specifically the Old Testament prophets, Sometimes reading the Old Testament prophets can be confusing uh, if you haven't had somebody help you understand it or guide you through it. And let me just break it down like this. When you read the Old Testament prophets, there are two things they are hammering, two things they consistently harp on. Idolatry is one of them. Loving something other than God, something more than God. Having something in your life that means more to you or you love more than God, idolatry. And the second is this, not caring for the poor and the needy. Those are the two things you see the Old Testament prophets continually hammering, idolatry and not caring for the poor. Let's just look at a few passages right here. Leviticus chapter 19, 
And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 23. And when you reap a harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleaning after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 15. You shall give to him freely, and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him. Because for this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and all that you undertake. For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in your land. Psalm 140. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and will execute justice for the needy. Proverbs 14. Whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. Proverbs 17. Whoever mocks the poor insults his maker. He who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. Proverbs 19, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. Proverbs 21, whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. Proverbs 22, whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed, for he shares his bread with the poor. Proverbs 22, 16, whoever oppresses the poor to increase his own wealth or gives to the rich will only come to poverty. Proverbs 28, whoever gives to the poor will not want, but he who hides his eyes will get many a curse. Proverbs 31, open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Ezekiel 16, behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease but did not aid the poor and the needy. Isaiah 58, is not this the fast that I chose to loose the bonds of the wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Luke chapter 22, sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with treasure in the heavens that does not fail, nor thief approaches, nor moth destroy. Luke 14, and he said to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not go and invite your friends and your brothers and your relatives and your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the the blind, And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Galatians chapter two. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing we were eager to do. First John chapter three. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word and talk, but in deed and truth. These are just a few. And if you were trying to take notes, don't worry about it. Just Google scriptures on poverty and there's more pages than this that will pop up. The Bible speaks about this. And this last part is let's not just do this in, in word, but let's do it in deed. Let's not just let this be something we say and, we, and makes us feel good because we post something about it on Facebook. Posting something about it on Facebook is not actually doing something. Right, And sometimes we get confused that we think that because we heard something and we have a certain feeling about it, we've done something. We, wanna, we don't just wanna be people that hear only, we wanna put this stuff into action the way that we live our lives. As Christians, do we believe the Bible or not? Is this the word of God or is it not? And if it is, does our life reflect it? Does the way I live my life reflect this? And this is something for you to allow the Holy Spirit to show you even right now. Like, not just even just looking at all the things you do, but the attitude of your own heart. What is the attitude of your heart to the poor and the needy? Not just the right things you know to say, because we're all sophisticated. We've all been around church enough, we know the right things to say. This is about you being honest with yourself and about letting the Holy Spirit show you This is important because the Bible cares. And why does this matter so much? 
I'll pause just a moment and I'll come back to that. Several weeks ago, my stepfather passed away. And we had a celebration of his life right here, and it was wonderful to come in and, and mourn together and grieve the loss, but also to celebrate what God had done in his life. And he had served in the military. And it's very beautiful at, at funerals and memorial services when someone has served in the military. Oftentimes, members of the military will come and present the living relative with a flag. And Lynn had served in the military, and so they came and they presented my mom with a flag. And they're, you know, they're, they're in the back playing taps, and these soldiers, they look so sharp, and they, they walk in, and they come, and they kneel down in front of the living relative, and they hand them this flag, and they say, you know, please receive this flag on behalf of a grateful nation. And then they, they stand up, and there's like this slow salute while taps plays. And it feels kind of awkward at first because they're going so slow, but all of a sudden, you start to feel a lump in your throat, and you get tears in your eyes because it's so, so meaningful that they did this. Right? Maybe you've seen that. The American flag means something, and that's why they come and they present it like that. When they present that flag that way, they're not just handing you, you know, a wad of material and stitching and, and color dye. They're handing you something that means something. Why do we salute when we see the American flag? Why, why do we treat it with such care? If it's a brand new flag or if it's one that's old and weathered and ripped, we still treat it with such care because it, it stands for something. It stands for a, a shared history, principles and pride and freedom and liberty and it stands for all these things, right? It's more than just material. It's a symbol of something that matters to all of us. That's why like when I was in Africa and I was living there for a year, I would get homesick sometimes and I would drive down to Nairobi about 45 minutes from where we lived and I, I had discovered an area of town uh, where a lot of the ambassadors lived and I found out where the American ambassador's house was. And they always had like a American flag, you know, flown there and they had a Marine standing out front. Dude, that guy looks so boss. Do they say boss anymore? No, they don't. If I ever think something is cool to say, it probably means it's not anymore. <laughs> he looked bad. He looked awesome. Let's just go with that. Standing there, the stripe, you know, the hat. And I would go by and I would see that flag and I would just feel such, I would feel a sense of pride. It would make me feel connected to home. Sometimes I would even like roll my window down and I'll go, USA, USA. And he would watch me drive by. <laughs> and then he'd watch me come back by this way. You know, we're paying attention to you. <laughs> but see, it means something. It stands for something. So listen to this. Helping the poor is important because it reminds us that everybody is created in the image of God. That human being reminds us that every person, rich or poor, carries the same image of God. That's why it's wrong to show partiality. That's why Jesus would get so mad at that when people would prefer the good seats to the rich and the bad seats to the poor and because they have money in this world. And, but everybody equally carries the image of God. This is why it's so important. When you, um, when you read Genesis chapter one, the creation account, everything that God creates, he speaks to it. Let there be light and all this. You know, speak. But when he, speaks to you, when he creates humanity, he speaks to himself. He said, let us make man in our image. And in his image, he created a male and female. We are created in the image of God. Every human being carries that image. This is so important because when you get to the book of Exodus and you see God giving Israel the Ten Commandments and he tells them not to have any false idols, not to make any, and it expands on that, to, not to make any graven images and all that. When you, when you read that, the word idol that he uses when he says have no false idols, it is the same Hebrew word that God uses when he said let us make man in our image. The word image and the word idol are the same word. And this makes total sense because in this context, think about this, Israel has come out of Egypt and in Egypt, they've seen all these different gods. They all worship all these different gods. And they have idols for all these different gods. And that's why they're there with Aaron. And they're like, look, we want to worship God, but we don't know what God looks like. Show us what God looks like. Make us an image because we want to have something that we can look at just like everyone else. And God tells them, don't do that. And the reason God says don't do that is because God is saying, I already did don't make some thing out of your hands and say, this is the image of God. Don't you understand? I already did that. You're it. You're the idol of God. 
Not the object of God's worship. You're the image of God. And that's why we don't need to do that. And so that's why throughout Scripture, you cannot separate loving God and loving other people. Jesus, what is the most important commandment in all the law? They're asking the Son of God, the giver of the law. And he says, here it is. Love God with everything inside of you. Heart, mind, soul, strength. And and the second is like it. You can't separate them. Love your neighbor as yourself. Can't separate the two. James, you can't love God. Thank you for giving me some feedback, whoever that is over there. I appreciate the help. Um, so you can't, James says, you can't love God whom you have seen if you don't love your brother whom you, wait, no. You can't love God whom you have not seen if you don't love your brother whom you have seen, right? You can't separate them. That's why this is so important. And it's why we have to defend the rights of all people, the, dig- the dignity of all people, not just the ones that can defend themselves. All people. It matters. And when we, when we care for the poor and the needy from this perspective, then we will prevent what some have defined as toxic charity. We will, we will, we will avoid things that create generational poverty when we do it this way. Right, because there's a right way to care for the poor, there's a right way to give, and there's also a wrong way. And the wrong way is this, when you do it to appease your own conscience. When you do it to take pride in what you've done, that's a wrong motive. When, when you're giving for that reason, you're gonna probably do it for the wrong reason. And then what we end up doing when we give that way is we don't understand issues, and so we create generational problems, generational poverty. There's a right way to do it. That's why it's important for us. I want you to have a right attitude toward anybody, any human being, poor or rich. I want your impulse when you see them is that is somebody that matters to God, they carry his image and not avoid them, right? But also, when we do get involved in some kind of ministry or some kind of charity, we wanna make sure that we do it the right way so we don't inadvertently create more of a problem because there is generational poverty and sometimes the way poverty's done reinforces that. It makes people, it makes people sort of in bondage to the system. And uh, Lydia, my daughter, when she was doing her senior, senior thesis, thesis, she chose to do it on this topic of toxic charity. And, uh, and she did a lot of research, and when she interviewed Dr. Julie McKay, who is you know, in our church here and has done a lot of charity work with Samaritan Purse and missions, outreaches, and YWAM and various things. And Dr. McKay told Lydia this illustration, that she was on one trip to Honduras, and they were doing a medical clinic, and they were helping build the church. And here's what she witnessed. They spent $35,000 on equipment and resources to help build a church. Meanwhile, the locals that lived there stood around watching. And you had people that didn't know how to use the equipment trying to use it, people who weren't actually builders. You know, they're, they do other things. They're, they're school teachers. They're, you know, whatever, lawyers. They do whatever. And now they're here down on this trip trying to build something. Instead of, she said, what would have been better is we'd have taken that money and invested it in the local community and hired the locals to build the church. We could work alongside with them. You know, but hire them to do it. That way you're impacting the local economy and you're giving them, you know, a sense of being a part of what they're doing, not like having to wait for the people from America to come down and fix it all, right? And Bob Upton, he wrote a book on this and he said he's been to missions trips where schools have been painted three times in one year. And he asked the principal, why has the school been painted three times this year? And he said, because Americans need something to do when they come down here. Now listen, we're, we're a church that supports missions. We want to go on short-term mission trips. I want everybody in this church to go on a short-term mission trip. But we want to partner strategically to do it with people that are impacting communities the right way so that we don't continue to make a problem, that, make a problem worse that already exists. Amen? Are you with me on that? So we have some strategic partnerships even here. We partner with Mission House, the Malavia Washington Kids Foundation, the Epley Backpack Drive, others around here, the, the, the new ministry that's there at the Seawalk Pavilion for the homeless. There's a lot down in Jack's Beach. We're trying to find strategic partnerships so that we can help make the problem better, not worse. Now, I want you to do the same. If you're giving in your own private life to some organization or whatever, find out about it. So we want to be generous. We want to give. 
We want to have a right attitude. And I want to encourage you, just really guard your heart on this because all of us have probably done this. We drive up to the traffic light and somebody's there with a sign and we have a couple of impulses. One impulse is, why don't they get a job? Why don't they, you know, they probably go, and I've heard this so many times, because somebody heard this story somewhere, they now think everybody that is in that situation has a very nice car park somewhere, and that when they're done, they go get in a nice car and they go drive. You all probably heard that. You probably, but no one, have you ever actually seen that? I mean, let's not just assume that's what they're doing. Let's let our impulse to say, well, for whatever reason that person is doing that, right or wrong, they carry the image of God. And I wanna speak to that. And I wanna bless that, amen? Let's make sure we guard our hearts. Every person carries his image. Now, Daniil's already out here, which means they're trying to play me off the stage. <laughs> but I'm not quite done yet. Because there's a second thing, but I'll, but I'll go fast. You just keep going, it's good. <laughs> Makes me feel like I got some company up here. So a second reason to, to care for the poor is this. Now, pl please follow this, this is crucial. Helping the poor is important because it reminds us that we are all spiritually bankrupt. It reminds us of the grace of God in our own lives. Because of sin, we are all born into spiritual poverty, unable to redeem ourselves, unable to stand, to, to save ourselves. Right? We can't do it on our own. So just like somebody in, a, in need needs us to sometimes step in and give them a lift up, we, we needed to be lifted out of our spiritual condition, out of our spiritual poverty. And when you serve the poor and when you help, here's, it does a couple of things. It, it remi it's a reminder, but it is also a warning. And warnings are all around us and they're important. Warning us of our spiritual condition without Christ. In 1980, was anybody around in 1980? <laughs> a few, a few, none of over here. In 1980, um, it was a great year. <laughs> in 1980, though, something really tragic happened in the news. And you might remember this, up in Washington State, it was the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Remember this, it was a volcano that for several months there had been earthquakes, there had been signs that something was about to happen, and this was, this was an eruption that was so devastating, unlike any that most of us had ever seen in our, our lifetime for sure. And it was all over the news nightly. And there was a guy during that two months that became sort of a folk legend. His name is Harry Truman, that's him right there. Harry Truman, not the president, uh, this is Harry R. Truman, not the president of the United States, but he lived there on the side of Mount St. Helens and he actually ran an inn right there. And they kept coming and telling him he needed to leave. And he's like, nah, they're just, this is just a bunch of, it's fake. They're just trying to blow it up. They're just trying to make a news story out of it. Not blow it up, blow it up, but they're just trying to like blow it out of proportion and make it a bigger deal. And it's just fine, I've been through this before. And he wouldn't leave. And at, even the night before the eruption of Mount St. Helens, they came up there and they tried to save him. They tried to get him off of the side of that mountain. He would not go. And that morning it blew. And it blew the whole side of the mountain. You can watch videos of it on YouTube. You can look and see what it did. I mean, it blew the whole side of the mountain. He was, they say, probably died within one second. And, and every area where that was was just buried under hundreds of feet of lava and ash. Well, I don't want you to miss the warnings. I don't want you to be somebody standing on the side of the mountain with the warning that I don't need to be saved. And, and the warnings are all around us. We, under, we need to understand we need the grace of God in our lives. We are all like that. But God, in his love and mercy, poured out all the riches of his grace into our lives. That's what he's done for us. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. It's by grace that you've been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Romans tells us that all of us have sinned and fall short. And by the way, let me, that fall short sometimes is misunderstood because it makes it seem like we gotta keep trying and keep trying and I get so close and I just fall short. But actually, if you really study that out, it means more like this. For all have sinned and failed to live within the glory of God. We're all justified freely by his grace 
through the redemption that came from Jesus Christ. The wages of sin, we've all sinned, and the wages of sin is death. That's what we've earned. That's the wage that we're due. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Isaiah said this. He's like, look, every one of us, we're like sheep that have gone our own way. We've turned away. We've gone our own way. And then it goes on to say, prophesying about the Messiah, but God laid upon Jesus, laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He paid our debt for us. God demonstrated his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God already demonstrated his love for you. He loves you so much that even when you're in your worst state, Christ died for you. And if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you will be saved. That's what the Bible teaches us. And then finally this. And God has taken us from that place where we were on the side of Mount St. Helens as we put our faith in him, and he's lifted us up and seated us with Christ in heavenly places. Amen? Aren't you glad you're seated with him in heavenly places? And not at a place of certain doom? When we serve the poor, it, it reminds us that every person carries his image. It also reminds us of our great need, of our spiritual poverty and our need for him. I wanna lead us in a prayer right now, and then I'm gonna have you just remain seated. We'll do something a little bit different today. This is a season of Lent, and so we wanna take a time for a, a little more self-reflection. And after I pray, and before we come to communion, their worship team's gonna do a song that's kind of minister to us. And I really wanna allow you to let that, uh, listen to it and let the Holy Spirit just make it your own. Let it be real to you. So that when we leave today, we haven't just heard something, but we leave changed. That our Christianity will be reflected in how we live our lives and how we view others. Amen? Would you pray with me? You just repeat after me, but you mean this in your own heart. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. Have mercy on me and forgive me through your son, my savior. Lord Jesus, I believe you lived on this earth. You died for my sin. You rose and now live. I yield to you. Be my Lord. Holy Spirit, fill me with power and passion to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Father, I pray in these next